Welcome to this ATA Insights webinar. Thank you for your ongoing interest and support of our webinar program. Today's session will begin in two minutes. ATA Insights webinars is an online platform for the dissemination of professional renewable energy knowledge across international borders. Our aim is to democratize access to information, for innovation to spread faster and to make the industry more competitive. And we do this through our online session, open to all our members. Every year we do more than 100 sessions with over 250 speakers, 50,000 attendees from more than 50 countries. To participate in the session today, use the chat on the right hand side to introduce yourself, your company and where you're joining from. Under the screen you will find the Q&A box where you can send your questions for the speakers. We will get to as many as we can today. We're recording this session and we will send you a link to the materials in a few days. Please consider supporting our content creation for the webinar program. Contact us on the email on screen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome everyone to this webinar on how to design and operate cost-competitive thermal storage solutions. As you know, as more renewables join the, the grid, then we get with the issue of how to manage variability for the variable resources of wind and, and, and solar PV. And we're looking at uh, today as solar uh, thermal storage solutions that can actually help us um, mix together and uh, and actually manage all that variability in the grid. Uh, thermal solutions are the, 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 the sister, I suppose, of uh, battery storage, but they're the sometimes uh, better known in terms of how long they've been around, but certainly less known in terms of how much uh, they have been deployed in the last few months. So with us today, we have experts that are going to be telling you how to properly design those systems that can work for your projects. And I'd like to welcome them. I'd like to welcome, first of all, Michael Geyer. If you could please, Michael, introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Michael Geyer. And I have spent, I think, the last 30 years of my professional careers in developing uh, uh, thermal storage, uh, first for concentrating solar power plants. Uh, and uh, today, I would like to explain you how this technology also can be brought beyond uh, the concentrated solar power technology and be useful to provide heat and power generated with renewable variable electricity from wind and from PV, for example. Thank you very much, Michael. Next, I'd like to ask Felipe to introduce yourself, please. Uh, thank you very much, Belen. Uh, my name is Felipe Gallardo. I am business development manager for Asilio. At Asilio, um, we developed a solution that stores uh, electricity as thermal energy and then delivers as well electricity and heat. So very, very excited to be here discussing uh, how to design and to operate cost competitive solutions with Asilio and, and with thermal energy storage in general. Excellent. Thank you very much, Felipe. And last but not least, uh, Alberto, please, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you, Belen. Hi, everyone. I'm Alberto Crespiniesta uh, from Energy Nest, and I'm representing the, the project development department uh, that as I'm running several projects in different, different sectors. So I will be providing some more insights on the different applications and more insights on our thermal battery solution. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, as I was saying before, uh, this technology is by no means new. You know, thermal uh, storage is by no means new. The same way that, you know, pump hydro has been going for a very many years, uh, so has uh, thermal storage. Uh, however, um, 
as of late, we've heard more and more about battery and all the power electronics, but a thermal storage certainly has a lot of gravitas and a lot of uh, um, usability things that we can do with it that are very, very useful to the system today. So the way that we're going to do the presentations today are first, Michael's going to speak, then Felipe, then Alberto. Each of them are going to talk to you about their specific systems, you know, all different uh, approaches of this thermal storage. And then after that, we're going to take questions. And the questions that we're going to take come from you guys uh, on the screen. Whether you are in my ATA, because I see a lot of people are connected there, or whether you're on YouTube, your questions are equally welcome. So please, if you could send uh, those questions to us, and we're, we have actually my colleague Andres that is like on the back office, uh, picking your questions up and sending them to us so that we can do them. OK, so please do send them. And just to let you know, we are recording this session. The session will be available afterwards, and so will the materials as with our webinars all the time. So without further ado, I'd just like to ask Michael, please, to share your screen so that we can prepare for your presentation. And um, and then thereafter, we'll, we'll do the others as well. So here we go. We've got Michael's screen. And go right ahead, Michael. We can see your screen, and I think we can hear Perfectly. you. Perfectly. Perf you can hear me? Yes, we can. Perfectly, uh, dear uh, yeah, colleagues and friends. Uh, today, I want to present you Malta's solution for long-duration energy storage uh, for a fair energy transition. And just to introduce you uh, to Malta, the uh, Malta was uh, it's a startup that was born uh, in 2015 uh, at the incubator Google X to check the viability of the idea to add uh, uh, heat pumps to molten salt storage system in order to make them more efficient and make them available also as storage for electricity and heat for um, 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 and, uh, PV and uh, wind and other systems. And here the other uh, uh, shareholder is Breakthrough Energy Ventures, that is the fund of uh, Bill Gates for climate protection, and uh, Proman, who is uh, a user and EPC contractor, and we have as technology partners uh, for the key components heat exchangers, Alpha Laval, who is also a shareholder, and Siemens Energy for the development of the turbo machinery. Now, what uh, is the uh, target of this system? The target of the system is that we have a thermal battery. It's also called a Carnot battery, where we put electricity in, power to heat. We uh, store it as heat, and then we get power out and heat out, and so, we can make a, a CO2 free power and CO2 free heat. Now, when looking at, let's say, a breakthrough system, we uh, Malta was looking at what is, let's say, the most mature and the most uh, the most uh, uh, distributed and with best track record uh, storage system that exists. Of course, there's the pump hydro, and this is, let's say, 94% of world storage uh, today. And the rest 6%, everybody thinks that is lithium ion batteries. No, uh, over half of it is uh, molten salt thermal storage. Worldwide, we have some uh, 22,000 gigawatt hours installed. And here I have a picture of just, let's say, the, 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 the current largest, world's largest storage system that is in construction that is 700 megawatts in, uh, in, uh, in four CSP plants with storage for 12 hours. So that is about 10 gigawatt hours of storage in Dubai that is currently under construction. And Malta makes this technology available, competitive and viable for PV and wind. And here just to give you, let's say the track record of molten salt storage worldwide an impression. And so what does the Malta system do. Malta is pumped heat electricity storage and it uses the molten salt that I just have shown you that uh, is bankable, mature, available uh, from the CSP system. And it wants to make this available as for long duration energy storage for, uh, 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 for, for example, PV and wind. And if you would do the simple approach, uh, you instead of heating up the molten salt with the uh, with the mirrors, 
you would take a resistance heater, heat it uh, up with uh, uh, renewable electricity at some 95% to 98% uh, uh, power to heat. And then you would reconvert it in a Rankine cycle at some yeah, 43%. Uh, percent. And then you would have a round trip charge discharge uh, efficiency of some uh, 40%. Percent. And so Malta tries to improve this, uh, and it improves this to up to 60% round trip efficiency, electricity in uh, to electricity out. And this is by taking here the molten salt system that is uh, known, adding to it a, a low temperature level. Uh, these are, uh, these are uh, coolant tanks, uh, which have some uh, temperature between uh, plus, 20, uh, plus 25 and minus 60. And then it, during charging, it acts as a heat pump by using turbo, a turbo machinery uh, compressor uh, and using a closed loop Brayton air cycle. And so uh, basically it pumps the heat from the cold uh, 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 storage uh, tanks to the hot storage tanks. So it's like a, a, a pumped hydro, but it's a pumped heat system. And here, when pumping this heat uh, uh, from the cold uh, tanks to the hot tanks, it has a coefficient of performance of some 1.4. And then it reconverts it with other turbo machinery at some 43% uh, percent so that you have the 1.4 by the 0 0.43. Uh, that gives you an, uh, uh, a round trip efficiency of some uh, 60%. Good thing is it is for long duration electricity storage, 10 to 24 hours. First systems uh, are already uh, competitive with lithium ion batteries at some 200 euro per kilowatt hour. In long term, this can go, out and go down to some 100 euro per kilowatt hour. It has a very long useful life. The molten salt systems are designed for over 25 years. The Dubai system is designed for 35 years. And it provides with its uh, uh, turbo machinery rotating inertia uh, to substitute the rotating synchronous inertia uh, that uh, will be retired from the fossil thermal plants. You can separate charge and discharge capacity. That means you can uh, charge the system in, uh, in, let's say, eight sunlight hours and then discharge in 16 uh, hours over the night. And uh, you also have heat. So this means you can put electricity in and you get power out and you can heat, get useful heat out at some 120 degrees centigrade for district heating, district cooling. So in, uh, in detail, this looks like this. For charging the heat pump, you have a turbo machinery uh, train, a charging train that has a compressor that here you get uh, the heat from the recuperator enter at some 270 degrees centigrade, you exit at some 575, and then you pass this uh, uh, heat uh, to the molten salt. And uh, at discharge, you take the molten salt, uh, uh, leave the, leave the, uh, leave, uh, 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 leave, generate st uh, hot pressurized air at some uh, 550 degrees centigrade. And then with this, you produce power. And as I tell you, uh, the round trip efficiency for charging to discharging is some 60%. And you produce some uh, uh, dispatchable heat. So the, uh, the uh, uh, 3D view of such a system would look like uh, similar, like uh, you, they are known from the molten salt storage systems at the CSP plants. Here you have the uh, uh, molten salt tanks. Here you have the coolant tanks. Here you have the heat exchangers and the turbo machinery. And again, the great thing here that this, since this is turbo machinery, you can substitute here PV plus such a system can fully substitute a gas plant and provide the same grid stabilization services as a, a, a gas power plant, and it can provide industrial process heat uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, for at a temperature, as I told, at some 150 degrees centigrade. So uh, this is a summary of the uh, of the, um, the technical characteristics of the standard 
100 megawatt storage system. There's a rated discharge power of some 100 megawatt, rated charge power of some 180 megawatt. And it is, let's say, uh, best between 10 and 24 plus hours, uses some uh, seven to nine hectares and has a round trip efficiency of some 55 to 60%. Heat losses per day less than 1%, lifetime more than 25 years. As I told you, this is gas turbine technology, so it can be used to control grid stability and uh, give auxiliary service as a gas turbine. And you can uh, connect this as uh, a storage only to the grid, uh, or you can uh, connect it as part of a wind plant or a PV plant uh, uh, to, uh, in order to convert variable renewable into dispatchable power and heat. The good thing is you can vary also the, uh, the, the charging power by putting a different charging and discharging trains. So uh, you can adapt this uh, to the needs. And basically with this, uh, you can get long duration storage uh, at grid scale and, uh, and at, low, uh, at low cost. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for your presentation. I think there is uh, there is a lot of interest in this technology, and, uh, and it's interesting to see, you know, how much efficiency it can have. You know, taking ele electricity, heat, and then electricity again. But we'll discuss this in the Q and A. I'd like to ask now uh, the next speaker, who would be Felipe, to uh, prepare your uh, your your screen, please, uh, your presentation, and just. Uh, I've seen some questions in uh, Maya Insights uh, about the materials. Yes, they will be available, so you don't have to worry. We'll send you an email with a link. Go right ahead, uh, Felipe. Perfect. Thank you very much, Belen. Um, and thanks again for the invitation. Um, I will be talking today about um, Asilio Thermal Energy Storage, the, our test spot. First, uh, Asilio is a Swedish company. We are manufacturers of technology. And uh, we have been around since 2008. We are a medium-sized company and uh, located in the west coast of, of, of Sweden. So our concept, the test put, is also thermal energy storage. It's uh, thermal energy storage for power on demand. But it is a little bit different from uh, uh, molten salts or, or other type of storages that use uh, sensitive heat. What, what we use in our technology is the latent heat of uh, aluminum alloy. Uh, that means that uh, we store the electricity, we take this renewable electricity coming from, from solar PV, from wind, from any, any source of electricity, we, we store it by melting an aluminum. So we transform this electricity in, in high temperature heat. And then whenever we need to generate again, uh, we transform back the heat into, into um, el electricity by means of our core technology here in Asilio, which is the Sterling engine, which is a beautiful solution uh, with yeah more than 100 years, I would say, that it has been proposed the, the, as, as a cycle. However, we here have perfected it and, 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 and use it as, as, as our core uh, power block in order to transform heat into electricity at a very high efficiency. So our solution is also tailored for small scale. That means that um, our test pod uh, provides 13 kilowatts. It's a very small size unit, 13 kilowatts. And when fully charged, can pr provide this thir 13 kilowatts during 13 hours. So 13 is it's our lucky number in Azilio. And of course, we our technology is modular. That means that we can have uh, much larger sizes for, for projects, let's say up to 100 kilowatts, 200 kilowatts, even megawatts. Um, the, the trick with Azilio is that you can install many modules and that would escalate the power you're installing. So you can install 50 kilowatts with four modules or you can install 100 kilowatts or one megawatt, but you will always get um, an energy capacity of 13 times the power you're installing because of its uh, construction. And so you can really have clusters of, of test pods uh, of, of these units of 13 kilowatts. And, and we provide also the, the control for, for these clusters. So um, we, as technology providers, uh, will we'll provide you with this uh, clusterized solution of test pods. 
Now the the operation or the operational philosophy of this is that you can uh, you can really get for small scale or for commercial and industrial scales 24/7 energy supply. So you do that by uh, using your renewable energy source or your low cost energy source directly to supply the, the, the demand when it is available. Let's say for, for a straightforward example that we are charging from PV, solar PV. So you can supply your demands during the day with solar PV. And then you can also oversize the solar PV so you can charge a Celio during the day at the same time you provide the demand. And then during the night, a Celio will uh, supply the demand by means of the energy it has stored during the day. So a little bit more about the, the technology. Uh, our technology is a fully integrated system. You can think of it as a black box. However, um, it, it, it is composed by two main components. So the first one is the tank where we store the, the, the energy by melting this aluminum. Um, uh, the, the tank is completely isolated. Uh, uh, the aluminum within the tank is completely isolated. And uh, this is the, the breakthrough innovation of, of Asilio, I would say. It's, it's, it's this uh, aluminum tank where we really store the, the, the energy. Now, uh, some advantages in comparison to electrochemical batteries is that there is no degradation in this process uh, because we are using the latent heat of the aluminum. So it doesn't matter how many times you cycle, you can freeze and melt the aluminum and, and cycle or how many years you have it. Um, you will always get the same uh, storage capacity of the medium if you operate within, within the operational range, of course, in, in temperature. Um, so there is no degradation. That means that there is no need for replacements after year 10 or year five, which is usually the case for electrochemical batteries. Um, and our solution has a uh, life uh, of uh, 30 years. So that's three decades uh, with no degradation. And then our second main component, which is also part an integral part of our unit, is the Stirling engine, which we use uh, to, to produce the electricity when, when there is a need for it. And, and we do that by withdrawing the heat. We use a heat transfer fluid heat to withdraw the heat from the aluminum tank, which is completely static and, and sitting within the tank. And we do that uh, by, by means of uh, heat the uh, exchanger, a cross flow heat exchanger, and we give the heat to the to the Stirling engine, and the engine basically provides uh, uh, shaft power, and, and that is coupled to a generator. So we are able to produce electricity. Um, we produce electricity, and simultaneously we can produce as well uh, heat. So our solution is really a CHP solution, in the sense that we can provide this low temperature heat that it's coming from the cooling of the of the engine. So we can provide between 50 and 60 Celsius degrees while we are producing electricity, which comes very handy for some clients and can really improve the, the economics of the solution. Now, this is a summary of, of, of a Cilio solution. As I mentioned, there is one component, which is the, the third, gi giving the 13 hours of storage capacity, which is the tank. Um, we use recycled and recyclable aluminum. It's, it's an asset at the end of the life of the project with no degradation. We don't have any uh, use of scarce materials or conflictive materials. We then have our uh, Sterling engine, which is our power block. It's a very efficient engine. Of course, the round trip efficiency cannot be comparable to a uh, electrochemical battery. However, I uh, liked a lot the name of this webinar because it says uh, design and operation of cost efficient solutions. And what we really Really I'm aiming for is cost efficient solutions uh, with, with these thermal energy storage systems. Perhaps the, the round trip efficiency is not the highest, but then at the end of the day, when you consider there is no degradation, when you consider that you have 100% depth of discharge, you end up with a, a, a cost competitive solution. And of course, if you uh, have a heat uh, demand, then the energy usage uh, can be very, very high, up to 90%. Um, so I have an example today because I think examples are always good to picture what can be done with the technology also from an economic point of view. So this is a client that we're assessing a project for, uh, for obvious reasons, I'm not including any sensitive information, but basically he is relying on diesel genset. It has a demand of 50 kilowatts in the north of Chile to supply a pumping cluster, uh, a cluster of uh, pumps. And uh, what we are proposing is that we install solar PV to it supply this, the demand of these pumping systems that are running 24 seven during the day with solar PV, but also charging our system. And then during the night, uh, the test pod supplies the system and the diesel genset can stay there just as backup. Um, 
So the, uh, the design and the cost efficient size, the, the optimal size of this solution is always going to be a function, of course, of the alternative cost. So depending on how expensive is the energy that we are replacing and depending on what is the demand profile, what is the solar availability, solar resource, the GHI in this case, since we're using PV, the, the optimal size can change. But here we end up with an optimal size proposed of um, that, that, that is supplying an 84% of load factor, so covering 84% of the demand, um, both between PV and, and, and the test push. And so the diesel gens is still covering 15% uh, of the demand because this, this would be the cost efficient solution to do in, in this particular case for, for those particular costs of diesel that we were assessing. And this implies an LCOE of around $100 uh, for a 24-7 uh, solution, having a payback of around five years. LCOE, as you know, in this type of investment is mainly dominated by CAPEX, which in times is more or less half CAPEX is PV, half CAPEX is Asilio. I cannot disclose the particular costs of, of this project without an, an, uh, an NDA, but we would be very happy if you contact us to, to discuss projects in details and to do this kind of analysis for you guys. Um, of course, the OPEX is very, very low. The, this, these systems are mainly CAPEX intensives and, and the OPEX contribution of these systems are very low. Um, and yeah, I would like to present also today, and, and with this I finished, um, the value calculator of Asilio. So this kind of analysis at the very early stage, you can do if you have a project, you can come to our website and asilio.com slash value calculator. And you can, with very few data points, you can simulate more or less what would be, uh, what would be the value of, of, of our solution for your project. So you can put the demand, the type of profile you have, what is the, the the price of electricity that we're replacing. And then we can tell you more or less what is our LCOE. And then we can really start a conversation from, from there. And, and of course, it's just a, a first analysis. But then fr from there, we can contact you and, and assess the case more in detail. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for, my, for your time and for the presentation. Thank you very much, Felipe. I can see that all the contact details are there. So if anyone does have any questions about the cost that I completely understand you're not going to share with us, then they can get in touch with you. Um, now, next, we have the presentation from uh, Alberto about uh, the Energy Nest solution. If you can please share your screen, please, Alberto. We cannot hear your presence. Can yes. you? Yes. Yes. Can now, you hear me now? Yes, and we can see the screen, so go right ahead. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Belen, and thank you, everyone, for joining us in this uh, webinar. So I will be introducing to you more insights on the thermal battery and the different applications, and also to present you some of our uh, uh, commercial cases that we have right now uh, ongoing, and also uh, what else uh, we can do. Yeah? So let me start with um, showing you uh, a bit on, on our 10-year journey of the company that has been pretty exciting, I have to say. Since the company was founded in 2011, we have uh, gone through different steps. Um, in, 2000, in 2013, we completed our first laboratory scale uh, prototypes. Then we went to the, to the piloting stage of one megawatt hour at Mazdar uh, Institute that we concluded after uh, over two years of operation and 6,000 hours of operation validated by DMV and Fischner. Then one year later, we validated our supply chain and tested it by um, having one module right now on display uh, at the port of Rotterdam, as you can see in the picture there in the, in, the, in the slide. One year after, in 2019, we received our first commercial order from Italian energy company Eni. And same year, we also received funding from the prestigious SMEI Horizon 2020 program. One year later, last year, and besides COVID, uh, we delivered the, the thermal battery modules to Eni. And we also started the execution of other project developments uh, with Jaram that engineering is, is right now concluded, Siemens Energy and others. And last but not least, um, we have very recently received 100 and mil, 110 million euros of investment by the infrastructure fund uh, Infra Capital. Yeah. Now, what is the core of our of our solution of our the, the thermal battery? And that is the module. This, this is what you can see on the screen. This is the module on display at the port of Rotterdam, as I just mentioned, which is uh, made of a solid state uh, media, which is our our high performance thermal concrete uh, labeled as heatcrete. 
plus steel. The, the way we think about it is, is uh, modularity and simplicity. Uh, the integration is, is a plug and play um, installation of this uh, standard module simply by, by welding uh, a couple of welds uh, on top and at the bottom of, of the module. The process uh, that can handle go up to 427 degrees because of the usage of carbon steel for, for economic reasons and uh, can handle pressures above 100 bar. This does not prevent us from uh, tying in into processes that are above these 427 degrees, for example, in, in waste heat recovery, that, that is perfectly manageable. Um, in terms of maintenance, there are no moving parts in our system. The system is what you can see here. Uh, so essentially the system is maintenance free, except for the maintenance on the instrumentation and control valves and so on, such as in any other standard industrial facility. In terms of what each of these modules can store, it can go up to two megawatt hour for the 20 feet uh, standard container and double for the, for the larger size. And it has a lifetime uh, beyond 30 years. Now, uh, based on these modules, um, depending on the specifics of the project, we can arrive to the desired energy capacity by uh, simply uh, stacking these modules up to height, up to a height of five um, in height and um, in principle, uh, as, as many as you want uh, in parallel. So we can go from uh, um, scalability from a few megawatt hour to uh, the gigawatt hour scale, for example, in, in utility scale applications. In terms of a small uh, footprint, due to this um, stacking, we are um, pretty pretty good, I would say, with uh, for a 10 megawatt hour um, storage uh, system being below 100 uh, square meters uh, of, of footprint, including all the all the ancillary equipment, such as valves, uh, the pumps, etc. The thermal efficiency of the system, uh, in any case, is above 95 percent. Uh, if we go for utility scale applications, such as the CSP or power gen or other source of power generation, uh, it will be closer to 99 percent, basically um, due to the, the thermal losses of, of this sort of uh, equipment. Uh, the way we think of operation is also to, to minimize OPEX, so it is highly, highly automated, and the system responds within seconds to provide the nominal power. And in terms of the duration of the cycles, it can go from minutes to hours. Uh, basically, if we are in the minute scale, is to manage fluctuations in an existing steam grid, for example, as I will explain in the case of Yara. And in the case of hours, um, for, for applications of, of CSP or, or in, in industrial uh, settings. Yeah. Now, um, our system is also versatile in terms of the usage of, of, of heat transfer fluids. Uh, on the one hand, we can go with thermal oil or for that matter, uh, compressed water. And on the other hand, we can go with the, the two-phase uh, direct um, steam solution, in which uh, we can inject directly steam into the battery and provide steam back to the process. Yeah. And on the right-hand side, uh, I, I wanted to, to show you the flexibility and the, the, the versatility in terms of the applications. Um, the battery can be charged with electricity via resistances, for example, waste heat in an industrial setting, steam directly, as I already mentioned, or of course, uh, also um, CST or CSP. Yeah? And the battery would then deliver electricity via a bottom cycle. Yeah, We do not have um, any sort of uh, turbo machinery inside our system, but rather it, it will have to be uh, uh, an additional or a, or a C or a, or a steam generator, or a, uh, sorry, steam turbine. The provision of steam also for, for industrial cases and, and cooling, yeah? And out of all these applications, um, due to the, the versatility in terms of the, the sizes that the battery can, can handle for very small sizes to, to very large and the footprint and so on, um, we are very well positioned to, to the carbonite industry by means of, of electrification, waste recovery, uh, to provide steam. Yeah? And a proof of this is that we have two commercial projects right now in execution. Um, first is the direct steam system for Yaram in, in South Norway. Um, this system consists of four of these modules plus one pressure vessel in which we store excess processed steam from the facility to discharge this steam on demand to increase the flexibility of the existing assets and to um, help Yara manage in a, in a better way fluctuations in the steam demand. Uh, 
um, engineering has been completed and the next phase of the project is to the, the production of the thermal battery modules. The other project on the right hand side is the, the industrial solar thermal project we have with ENI in Sicily. Um, it consists of two thermal battery modules that are charged with, um, with the solar fields that ENI has uh, at the refinery. Um, and uh, this heat is used to, to produce a steam to run, uh, to run a steam turbine for on site electricity consumption. And uh, the modules have already been delivered to the client. And the next step is the actual construction and integration works. Now, um, also to offer an overview of, of the two main business models that we that we offer, depending on on the on who is the, the customer. On the one hand, we have the transactional, which is the conventional way of doing business in which the customer uh, invests the capex upfront and owns the thermal battery from 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 day one. While on the other side, we have what we call our EcoSteam leasing or STEL, which is essentially a fully financed turnkey of balance sheet solution in which both Energy Nest and the client uh, benefit from the savings that the system uh, brings to, to the client. And there is this profit sharing that uh, allows the, the client not to have to make heavy investments upfront, but rather have uh, uh, an immediate financial return. Um, from the project, while minimizing the risk significantly, of course. I wanted to show you one, one project example for, for industrial waste heat uh, recovery at a steel mill, uh, in which, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we are very well, we're very well positioned. In this specific case, we um, uh, recover heat from, a, from, a, from the flue gases of, a, of a exhaust um, source at, a, at, at this steel mill in Central Europe. And we use this heat to produce steam and electricity for on-site consumption. The thermal battery for this application is uh, 20 megawatt hour. And uh, we produce process steam at 12 bar and electricity production by means of an organic Rankine cycle of one megawatt uh, electric. Um, the 15-year MP MPV, um, it's in the order of 9 million euros with a project payback between four and five years. And also to provide also the impact on, on the carbonization, with this small size of battery, uh, we are able to, to reduce by 6,500 uh, tons per year the CO2 emissions on this specific site. Now, um, of course, we don't do all this alone, but rather we have a strong partnership um, ecosystem. Uh, and here I would like to, to, to put uh, the, our three main partners, which are TSK, um, Spanish-based uh, company, AC Boilers, uh, based in, in Italy, for all their expertise on the on the steam-based uh, systems and and, and Siemens Energy. And finally, um, we have a fully vetted and tested supply chain, starting from the fabrication of the heat grid and the steel and the steel works that are sent to our manufacturing hub at the port of of, of Rotterdam, as I already mentioned, where the the mixing of the heat grid happens, the casting. Uh, the curing and finally the preparation for uh, for shipment either by by road trailer or or ocean to deliver the module uh, validated by by third parties already to the to the customer so that by a simple integration you can arrive to the desired thermal battery capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto. Very, very interesting. I'm going to ask everyone else to come back in. Perfect that you're all here. It's amazing. I mean, it might have been a very old technology, thermal storage, but it seems like in the last few years it has gone a proper technology uh, upgrade. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for being here today to share all of this news and, uh, and all of this, this, um, these changes with the technology and these innovations. Um, it's clearly technology is not the issue. You know, I've been hearing you guys, you know, there is a lot of solutions for a lot of problems. The technology is not the issue. And I am sure that there is still it can be improved leaps and bounds, you know, in the future. It seems like the the the, the problem or the, the sticking point is not technology, but maybe business models or regulation. Uh, I'm not really quite sure which is it. So I'm going to ask you guys in particular, how do you see market evolving in terms of you know, perhaps business model, what your clients can do, and especially regulation, because 
we have never heard as much as we're hearing now about decarbonization of industry. It's just that we're not hearing that much noise about this particular technology, and I wonder why. So who wants to start with this? Michael, go on. Yeah, I think yesterday was an important day when the IEA in their presentation on the update on uh, for renewables 21-22 said we are in front of a historic game changer that we haven't seen the last hundred years that basically let's say we are from the us to europe to china the commitment on zero co2 let's say between 2045 and 2060 and this will require lots of storage uh, to substitute let's say all the thermal uh, fossil power generation, uh, fossil energy generation that we have used in industrial process and for electricity generation. And regulation, uh, let's say starting with the regulation, just grid codes, etc., they do have not yet included uh, storage, let's say, as an, as an element that uh, can on command consume uh, electricity power and on uh, command release it. We now have the Directive 944 of the European Union that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, gives the indication to the EU member states to put in such regulation. But today, for storage only in Europe, uh, we only have very few countries uh, where we have a business case. Uh, we have it, let's say, for fast frequency regulation in the UK, etc. But we don't have it for long duration energy storage. And I think we have it less for the provision of thermal uh, process heat, where basically I think the only support there is, is probably, let's say, uh, 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 subsidies for the investment. But there's nothing like, let's say, feed-in tariff long-term uh, long-term uh, 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 takeoff, and what we are doing is, with t we are substituting, let's say, 30 years of fossil fuel consumption upfront by technology investment, and there only will be all the investors for reaching the CO2 goals in the coming, let's say, 20, 25 to uh, 35 years, if they have a guarantee that their upfront investment somehow will be paid back. Totally. I mean, I couldn't agree more. There is, uh, there is a lot of talk right now of decarbonization and, you know, we, in renewable hydrogen or green hydrogen, we're hearing so much movement, so much money flowing in. I just don't see this, the same enthusiasm for something that can be done easier, cheaper, and doesn't require like a full revamp of everything and all of the infrastructure so you know i just i just wonder in here in regards to regulation whether you guys see that it's being fair do you see that green hydrogen is going to affect in a positive way in a negative way uh felipe i'm going i know that you feel passionate about this topic so perhaps you can start yes um yeah i think it's a great question so first about regulation i would say that um even if we are starting to see somehow that countries are making efforts to put in place regulation for storage and, and and we deal with this because we are certifying our technology to go to the different markets with, where we see our technology makes sense what we see normally is when when we start to read the regulation is the electric uh, energy storage defined as electrochemical storage or as electrochemical batteries you know so um and that creates uh, a lot of issues then when you're trying to certify the technology so even that so even to start to commercialize you uh, from the beginning start from from uh from a different place so that that's a barrier i think that uh, it's very easy to manage we have seen how that was very easy to manage in the past with the good examples of regulation put in place for for solar pv and for other technologies so i hope that that can be fixed easily and in the meantime it's just uh, more effort for us but i think we are all working on that and, and also my colleagues working with with that and regarding hydrogen i would say that it's obviously a big hype for hydrogen right now and this is something that uh, i personally I, I i also work as an energy researcher working in, in hydrogen and i think it's different markets complementary markets and the decarbonization challenge is so huge that there will be space for different technologies in particular for example when you see in mobility obviously light mobility for light vehicles uh, lithium-ion it's a good technology but then if you want to transport you know big uh, paid load 
and, and trucks and everything, hydrogen might be more interesting. I just don't see uh, that that these technologies will will compete for the same type of market. Same way as we don't compete with Malta for the same type of market or with Energy Nest or with lithium ion batteries. There is a huge market, like markets, and, and there is no silver bullet. This is very important also for the banks to understand and for the regulators to understand. There, there is no point in incentivizing a single type of technology. Um, uh, th there is no silver bullet for such a diverse uh, challenge as decarbonization. And I'm not even talking about the power sector. I'm talking about heat, transportation, and all of all other sectors. Yeah. Mm. From, from my from my perspective, uh, I agree with 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 Michael and, and Felipe. Um, given the huge amount of energy consumed by the industry, most of which is in the form of heat, um, a lot a lot more could be done. And as you are saying, Belen, uh, we have now solutions in the market ready to to tackle the carbonization specifically for for the industry and power generation, but industry specifically. Um, and 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 we believe that more could be done in that sense. And hydrogen. Um, one of the one of the let's say focus of hydrogen is also to replace fossil fuel consumption. Um, so um, if natural gas is being replaced over the years by hydrogen, industry will continue to require heat to run the processes and thermal storage is, is critical um, to balance all these all these processes. In that sense, we also think that is 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 complementary and it's good that more and more solutions are coming up. No, if anything, yeah, for me, it's, it's a question of whether a lot of this decarbonization drive that, you know, renewable hydrogen is, to, is supposed to look after can be, mm -hmm. especially in certain places, more easily accomplished with just, you know, thermal storage, solar heat, you know, just solutions that we all know, you know, and all of a sudden it seems like everyone is thinking silver bullet, uh, green hydrogen, I buy the certificates, I buy this, I forget about, you know, everything else remains the same, you know, it just feels like, there is a little bit of that going in the air. So, Felipe? Yes, I, I wanted to mention that you're just thinking a little bit more technically in the issue. Hydrogen, to like to provide heat, it's very expensive, like green hydrogen. And it will be, remain like, being a very expensive solution compared to what we can do today with energy storage and with thermal energy storage in particular. And, and, it, and, and it, it doesn't make too much sense to go through a, such a complex process just to burn the hydrogen. So, and I'm a big fan of hydrogen. I think it has a huge space in different applications, chemical applications, um, in particular, so, such as ammonia and, uh, and formic acid and everything you can do with hydrogen. Um, and then the other, the, the, the other possible uh, field of competition would be uh, electricity. So looking at what we are, have discussed today, so heat and electricity, electricity is just, it's very difficult for hydrogen to compete, I would say, to today, with even with batteries and, and for different scales. And then you have to remember that the green hydrogen, even though we are talking about 40 gigawatts to be installed in the next decade, the biggest project is like 20 megawatts. That's the biggest project yeah, and, and it's still under development. So it's, it's actually uh, yeah. 80, 40 in Europe and 40, outside of Europe, yes, for the consumption of the European Union, is huge numbers. And I mean, the bottom line is they're going to need thermal storage if they want to have enough hours to make the hydrogen low enough in cost. So it's a bit of the catch-22, isn't it? So, you know, it's just it's just one of the situations. But anyway, I, just, I asked my field of questions about hydrogen. It's impossible for me to, to ask about this at the moment because it seems like there is so much faith being put on this one technology and it has everything, you know, it has a market being created, it has the money, you know, being poured in. So, but, you know, uh, clearly we're going, go on, Michael, yeah, go and contextualize uh, I, this for us. I think, let's say, the money which is there is basically subsidies, billions of subsidies just for demonstration and for technology development. I don't see, let's say, the thousands of billions yet that are required, let's say, from private investors to invest, let's say, in hydrogen systems, which there are now in the in the PV and in, in, in the solar. So I think this is something where you have, let's say, a subsidy height currently in demo projects, which are 80% funded by grant, otherwise they would not be they would not be realistic. And so I think we need to develop this. But we will not have it in the market, uh, really, let's say, 50% uh, uh, like we have the renewables or 74%. Uh, what is the target of the Spanish CLEAC by 2030? 
Yeah, no, no, totally. Um, we will see what happens. I mean, there is so many questions in the air. What is clear is this 1,500 euros coming, you know, specifically in the Spanish market, but also so much more money in the recovery funds. But let's move along to other questions, guys, because we have about maybe eight minutes or so. So I'd like to ask a few questions that people have sent through. So one is very specific. Some are very specific, so I'm just going to ask them and we can ask uh, answer them quickly. Is What is the operating temperature of the heat pump being used by Malta? The Sid asks. Sid is an old friend working in India also in thermal in, in thermal heat. In, in, so, so he asks for the output temperature. The output temperature of the heat pump is 575 degrees centigrade. So you, uh, by compressing, you enter in the compressor with 270 degrees centigrade and you heat it up to 575 and thereby you can heat up the molten salt up to 565 degrees centigrade. Thank you very much, Michael. Next, uh, Asilius LCOE, when coupled to solar PV, providing 24-7, can be as low as 100. Oh, this is one of your answers, actually. The question is, what was the question? What's the LCOE of Asilio? Uh, what's the LCOE of Asilio? There you go. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, can you just answer it live? I just didn't. Yes, of course. So uh, Asilio's LCOE, of course, it's going to depend when, when we're talking about 24 seven of what is the cost of the of the charging source, what is the demand, what is the, you know, and that depends also on the solar resource and so on. But it can be as low, even at below $100 per, per megawatt hour. That is extremely dependent on the project. And it's also very dependent at the end when, because LCO is one metric. We are not big fans of that metric in the storage world in general, because it can be a bit confusing. So we normally look at the payback. So when we're replacing diesel genset payback, can be very, very low, as quick as five years. For example, if you're replacing a very expensive grid in a behind the meter project, it can be seven years. So it's going to depend of, of many factors. And I would say, and I'm going to also address a previous question, which is regarding business models. The business model and the project development infrastructure that you put together to, to, to you know, develop the project that is also very important and it's going to affect the way or the tariff or the final price that the client is looking at we at the CLU can provide also project development co-development we understand these technologies create a little bit of skepticism sometimes in financiers and, and users so we are there to to provide assistance and help in in all the permitting wise uh, development bringing finance and so on Actually, that question was from Pawan in Alphanar, and I told him that you wouldn't answer. So since you've answered, Pawan, you owe me one. Excellent. And uh, get in touch if you want to contact. OK. Um, so another question. Um, what is the best cost-effective way to use energy nest thermal battery by coupling it with CSP or retrofitting it with gas thermal power plants? And give operational examples if available. Also from Pawan, that question. So go right ahead, uh, Alberto. Yeah. It's quite project specific, uh, I have to say. Um, of course, if we can integrate into into an existing asset, so retrofitting essentially, for example, waste heat recovery from from an industrial exhaust gas stream, then uh, the installation of that waste heat recovery is cheaper than installing a complete new um, um, solar field. Yeah, uh, while the energy available for the battery will be the same. Um, on the other hand, the beauty of CSP is uh, the, the intrinsic, uh, let's say, link with, with the storage, which adds value uh, versus uh, PV, uh, right? Um, so there are other factors to be taken into account. Uh, CSP is more advanced in terms of regulation that we have spoken about. So then you can, you can, you can access all their remuneration schemes and so on. So it's, it's very much priority specific, I have to say. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. Next, uh, for Michael, one from Tiago. Uh, how can the round trip efficiency electricity to electricity be so high using a gas temperature with temperatures on the 550 uh, degrees range? Thank you. Uh, you know, I always ask you this question because everyone always asks this question, Michael. So okay. you, you the know the answer. By is, yeah, I mean, the first thing is that we have, let's say, a charging, we have a coefficient of performance of 1.4. That is very important. And the efficiency of the gas turbine is so high because we have on the one hand side 550 degree, but we operated with a delta T of until minus 60. So uh, by this, you have, let's say, a higher delta, uh, delta T. And so um, if you do then all the thermodynamic calculations, the epsilon modeling, you can come to that. Thank you very much. 
you know, I haven't understood that, but I am sure that Tiago has. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, um, I'm happy that uh, he can di direct me, us to the questions that we can give. Sure. Him. So, Tiago, if you would like to speak to Michael directly, uh, reach out. Um, to for another question from Tiago, but this one to Felipe. How is heat transferred from aluminium latent heat to the Stirling engine? Thank you. Yes, excellent question. We use a heat transfer fluid, which is liquid sodium. We use that either for charging and for discharging. So for charging, th there is a, an electrical heater, which is just a fancy name for a resistor, a resistance. And we dissipate the, the electricity into heat in this resistance. This resistance is in contact with the heat transfer fluid, which is surrounding the tank. So the tank has a double wall, which is a heat exchanger, a jacket heat exchanger is called, and that uh, being at a higher temperature melts the aluminum and then the reverse process is the same. We recirculate that the heat transfer fluid and, and take the heat out from the from the from the aluminium, which is on on a, on a phase changing state all the time. Thank you very much, Felipe. Okay, so another question: What happens when there is no heat available for heating the thermal battery? Is the fluid become solid? Uh, does the fluid no. become solid? Mm -hmm. The fluid is essentially the thermal oil used in the in the CSP plants. Can, can operate between, uh, well, sub-zero degrees, depending on the oil, up to 400 degrees. So it's always in, in liquid phase. Yeah? Uh, and the, and the, 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 the storage material is the, the solid state hypocrite, which is always in solid phase. Yeah? Plus there's no interface in any case between the, the steel pipes and the hypocrite. Yeah? Always the oil is contained within the steel piping, as in any other sort of plant, for example. Yeah? This is different from Malta, right, Michael? Well, in, in Malta, we have the uh, the hot tank at 565 and the cold tank at 270. Freezing is at 220. So basically, uh, the energy losses are 1% or one, uh, 1 degree per day. So you have about 200 days at least of uh, still stand uh, until you get, let's say, uh, to that, to that uh, uh, danger. Uh, and so what you have is you have an auxiliary heat uh, heat uh, heating system and so far let's say uh, with all the what over 15 years of molten salt systems worldwide none ever got frozen Thank you very much. Michael, so it's manageable, essentially, but you, you might need the, the back of heat or like to be think, thinking of heat tracing. Okay, there is a lot of questions here about, you know, the business model. And there is one here that says, is there a business model for long-term uh, storage uh, solutions using arbitrage, you know, um, whether standalone or with VRE plants? Then someone else said, um, do you see this technology allowing value stacking opportunities by participating in balancing services in three years from now if regulations allow? So I guess the easiest thing would be to just to sort of mix it into one and, you know, just talk a little bit about business models, we, we, which we had hinted on today. We know the regulation isn't there, but we know also that there are capacity markets being created, you know, um, in Europe in general, and I think in many other places. And hopefully, you know, we'll open more of a, of a, of a, um, uh, of an arbitrage, you know, someone, something else that he mentioned here, mark it in the future. But, you know, just leave it open for you guys to answer. So who wants to take that first? I think, let's say, long term, it is very easy. Long term, if we go to zero carbon and we are serious about it, there will be no uh, fossil plants to give us the service. And since, let's say, we want to have electricity continuously, non-interrupted uh, in many regions during the night, in the end, let's say uh, we will have to procure these, uh, uh, we will need long duration energy storage there. And in the end, uh, I mean, if we want this to have CO2 free, we will have to pay what it needs to get it. So that I think is, 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 is long term. But what we also have seen is that short term, if you have during the day PV costs, which are approaching 10 euros a megawatt hour, and let's say with storage, they cost something like 100 euro the, uh, the, the, the megawatt hour. In average, uh, let's say you would have something like 50 to 60 euro the megawatt hour uh, with storage. And that is what we pay today in average, let's say, uh, in, the, in the market. Short term, the problem is 
that there are no that all this is oriented to the daily auctions and that there are no business model and we need business models to attract investors to get the whole thing running and yeah that is the that is the challenge Thank you very much, Michael. Good point, Felipe. Yes, I would like to compliment a little bit for the reality of, uh, you know, Asilio, which is a smaller scale. We are providing a different number of business models that, you know, um, translate into different options for project development. We can provide you with a PPA. We can provide you with a PPA for electricity and heat. Uh, we can provide you for a long-term contract, take or pay for the use of the infrastructure only, and then you manage the energy. And ultimately, I would say we, we do provide this, all these options. Uh, they are different, depends on the financial reality and risk management in each country. But I would say that ultimately, the market always proves that the users are much more crea creative regarding the use of the technology, not only operational, but also in terms of business. And us as technology providers, I think we should always keep, uh, should keep an open mind regarding business models and, and, and try to see how, how we do business in, in the different contexts. We provide these project development alternatives. It's challenging. Um, because our solution it's 30 years you know so how do we translate into short-term benefits and i agree with everything that michael uh, just said but uh, also i think we should also keep an open mind because uh, project developers and you know energy managers experts they will always find creative ways on how to use the technology and we should be able to to help them to realize that thank you very much felipe and alberto Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, from our, from our side, we also offer the fully financed solutions to adapt to different, different business models, both for the long term, which essentially is, is something that will come more and more, but also on the short term to manage industrial fluctuations. And in that sense, the value stacking can be critical, yes, uh, to, to provide uh, ancillary services, but also to provide services that are key to the processes uh, by the industrial customers or, in this case, power generation overnight. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Michael and Felipe and Alberto. I think it's been a really great um, webinar. I mean, what we have to remember is that industrial users at the moment create what? About 40%, perhaps more of the CO2, the, the entire CO2 cake. You know, a lot of it goes in this direction. Mm -hmm. It is like an area that is ripe for decarbonization. We, it, it, it's, it's taking too long, really, but it's going in the right direction. Now we're already hearing of, you know, large international companies pressing their supply chain to decarbonize. You know, it's coming. It's coming too slowly. And it's not because the technology isn't there. It's because the regulation isn't there. Hence, the business case isn't there. You know, this is like the one takeaway here. There is a solution for whatever is your issue, you know, at the industrial level, whether you need heat, whether you need electricity, whether you need both. Uh, there is a solution for you. It's just a question of making it worth your while. And this is where regulation has to come in, proper CO2 price has to come in, and many other um, steps need to be taken. I feel like, in a way, you know, this whole move towards renewable hydrogen perhaps helps us along because it's created so much uh, money and awareness on this particular issue that it's moving us in the right direction hopefully you know so I'm going to choose to take it as an, a positive thing but there is really no time you know to idle really it's time to really for action so thank you very much to all of you for coming here and and explaining your solutions because you know it's the key part you know you, we need the technology but this is the thing the technology is ready now we just need to get deploying so thank you very much, the three of you, and hope that next year we come back, you know, and you tell me about all of those projects. You know, I've seen in the papers, you know, there are some projects, I think in all of the three companies, they're very, very interesting indeed in, in, in the works. So I hope that now, you know, our deployment starts to be exponential, hopefully. Once again, thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.